thing. Okay, just. Uh, okay, now we are live. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you, thank you so much for uh, for being here with us and accepting our invitation to give a talk uh, on quantum game theory. Uh, Professor uh, Faisal Shah Khan, uh, it is our like greatest honor to to have you here uh, for. Uh, for a, for a small introduction to quantum game theory in Alexandria Quantum Computing uh, Group and uh, the Alexandria Quantum Winter School 2021. Uh, also, it is our greatest pleasure to uh, to announce that uh, the uh, the Excellence Center for Quantum Computers in Alexandria is the main sponsor for this. And in the name of Professor Ahmed Yunus, uh, you are most welcome to uh, to start your uh, your uh, great session. So. Uh, Please introduce yourself and uh, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karim. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor actually to uh, to be here uh, to to give a talk about uh, this topic. Uh, and I'm grateful that you actually invited me. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, really have been following the Alexandria Group uh, Quantum Computing Group for a while. I've been in touch uh, with uh, Professor Ahmed Yunus. So it's really good to see everything coming together so nicely in the form of this winter school, uh, for example. Uh, I, I'm really sorry for uh, uh, being late. This connection problem. Uh, I'm Ahmed. Uh, I'm really glad you are here uh, and you finally uh, uh, can join us today. And I'm really looking for your talk, uh, Professor. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yunus. G good to talk to you. <laughs> it's been yeah, a while. Finally, finally, yes. <laughs> Awesome, wonderful. Thank you so much for the welcome, and I look forward to uh, you know interacting more with your group. It's it's uh, really quite something. So um, I'll I'll start with the uh, talk now. Um, I suppose I could. Uh, I do believe I have my screen sharing. So yes, the topic is quantum game theory. Uh, it's a, a topic that's been around officially uh, for I think basically 22 years, uh, formally speaking. Uh, so it's a new topic in that sense, and I think uh, perhaps not too many people might be familiar with this. So uh, I'm really excited to talk about this topic, uh, and hopefully at the end of the uh, the conversation, uh, you know, we'll have some good questions from the audience um, about what this is. Uh, so as for myself, uh, I am actually a chief science advisor at Dark Star Quantum Lab. Um, this is a lab that's based in North Carolina. Uh, in the US and I uh, it's uh, dealing with um, development of uh, what we like to call um, you know plug and play uh, technology quantum technology uh, in the sense that you know there are some devices that are already available in the market uh, for low G prices uh, which are quantum technologies uh, we like to interface them with existing technologies and uh, you know with the hope of making them uh, democratically available uh, to the public, which is uh, not the case typically uh, with quantum technology so far. Um, I also serve as a technology advisor to Quantum Computing Inc., uh, which is a Virginia based company. Uh, it's the only uh, quantum computing company that's uh, publicly traded in the US. Uh, so that's a unique thing about that company. And the company is actually working on um, developing uh, accessibility to quantum computing hardware uh, through the cloud. Uh, so if anybody wants to get in touch with me and I'll be happy if they do, uh, here's my email address. Uh, it's quantumsheikh at gmail.com. Um, uh, please do drop me a line uh, if you're interested in having a conversation about anything. Uh, so let me start with some physics, quantum physics. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of physics first and then we'll get into some game theory uh, and then we'll try to bring them together and see how to make quantum game theory out of this, this uh, you know, these two different uh, apparently disparate topics. Um, so the two slit experiment is, is something of a fundamental concept in physics, quantum physics. And the idea is uh, to see how quantum objects like photons or electrons, in this case we'll focus on photons, uh, behave differently than classical objects, objects that are big and massive and uh, live in the classical world, which is you know the world we inhabit and experience uh, in our everyday life. Uh, so we look at a photon, a photon source here on the screen, this little dot right here. Uh, 
uh, the photon source uh, emits photons and we'll imagine it's actually so precise as to emit uh, exactly one photon uh, in any given instance. Now, once we have a photon coming out, it's uh, coming out and going towards this wall right here. And this wall has two slits in it. And the question becomes, what is the probability of the photon going through uh, one of these two slits in the wall and uh, appearing or you know, getting detected on a on a opposing wall, if you will, where there's a detector uh, that registers the arrival of the photon. So if you were to imagine that these, this photon is a classical object like a bullet or, or some kind of a ball, right? Um, we would say, okay, well, there's a certain probability P1 associated with the fact that the photon went through the top slit here in the wall, and there's a certain probability P2 that the photon went through the lower slit in the wall. And uh, because we're thinking of them as, um, you know, the photon is, ima we're imagining it's a classical object, right, like a bullet or a ball, uh, we'll apply the additivity, additivity axiom of probabilities, which says that the probabilities of mutually exclusive events uh, or states sum up, right? So this is something we experience every day. Uh, something happens or it doesn't happen, but not both, right? So that's just the additivity axiom. Uh, by this axiom, the probability of the photon being detected should be, uh, the total probability should be just the sum of these two individual probabilities right here, as we see, right? P1 plus P2. P1 and P2 are just fractional numbers between zero and one. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on the point of view, uh, the additivity axiom does not apply. We just don't observe that as happening, as, as being applied. Uh, as being applicable to quantum objects like a photon. And what we in fact see is uh, something different where we have to come up with a new notion of a probability amplitude. Uh, so we have the same experiment set up here in, on this slide as before. There's a photon coming out of the photon source going towards the two uh, slits in the wall. And uh, what we see now is that there's no such thing as a probability of the photon taking one path, like the top path, for example. Rather, we can say there's a probability amplitude of the photon taking this path, and we call that A1. And similarly, probability amplitude of photon taking this path down below here, going through the second lower slit, and we call that A2. And we note that A1 and A2 are complex numbers, which is quite different than the previous case, right, where we were thinking of the photon as a classical object, like a ball or a bullet. The probabilities were real numbers between zero and one. Uh, here, there are th these are allowed to be complex numbers, right? Now, the probability of photon being detected on the wall here is not the sum of the probabilities as in the previous case. It is in fact the sum of the amplitudes a1 plus a2, which will give you another complex number, and you take the length of that complex number squared. So that's quite a departure from, from what we see with classical objects when we do these experiments in a lab, right? Or, or in a big lab, like a practical setting as well. Uh, so when we do experiments uh, of the same type with uh, quantum objects like a photon, we observe this phenomena. We, we do not observe uh, probabilities adding up, we observe probability amplitudes adding up. So this gives rise to uh, what we can call a revised additivity axiom. Uh, it's the uh, axiom that says the probability amplitudes of mutually exclusive events or states of a quantum object or any physical object sum up. So no longer are we working with real numbers between zero and one. We're working with complex numbers and we're adding them, taking their length and taking the square. So this is quite a departure, but this is something we can verify in the lab and, and it's been verified quite a bit. Uh, so, and, and this is of course the big idea that this probability amplitude is a quantum feature of the photon state. So photon is no longer considered a classical object. It's a quantum physical object rather than a classical physical object like a bullet or a ball. Okay, that sounds great. But the question would be then, uh, what do we, uh, what meaning do we put on this probability amplitude, right? Well, the idea is that we have to put a meaning on the uh, square of the length of this of these probability amplitudes, right? And those turn out to be real numbers. 
So we want to go from probability amplitudes to still the more familiar notion of probabilities that we're you know, so familiar with and comfortable with uh, living in our world, the classical physical world. So here's a little bit of algebra um, that I've got on the screen. I think it's not too painful. Uh, we can go through this really quickly. Uh, remember the idea was that the total probability of the uh, photon being detected having passed through you know, those two mutually exclusive events of passing through one slit or the other is the square of the length of the sum of the probability amplitudes. Uh, so if you're familiar with complex uh, number algebra, uh, it's just the case that uh, this expression right here, the square, uh, square of the length of the sum of two complex numbers is simply the multiplication of the complex number we get by adding the two uh, complex numbers A1 and A2 with this complex conjugate. Uh, when you work out the details, you get this expression right here. That's just based on the complex number algebra. Let's make a substitution here where we say AK is some real number RK, right, which is the um, length of the complex number. Now, if you're thinking of that in a geometric sense, sitting on a unit circle, multiplied by uh, some angle that it makes with the real axis. So this is a pretty standard expression for a complex number uh, in terms of uh, its length and uh, the angle, the phase is what we call it. Um, now, when I make the substitution up here in the expression for the probability, uh, I see that I get this expression with a cosine inside it, right? And uh, you may have noticed that this is just the law of cosines really uh, applied to uh, non-Pythagorean triangles, right? Now I'll make a few more substitutions here. Uh, we'll just for the sake of simplification call R1 square P1 and R2 square P2. And we get this expression P, the total probability of, of detecting a photon, observing a photon go through one or the other slit in the wall is the sum of the individual probabilities, P1 and P2, right? That we can think of as taking, you know, P1 is the path it took uh, to go through the top slit. P2 is the path it took to go through the bottom slit. But there's an extra feature here which is expressed in red font here. Um, this is what we call a quantum feature. This is not something we see with classical uh, objects, right? bullets or balls going through two slits. Now, this is what we call a phase. So the expression uh, theta one minus theta two is what we call phase, quantum phase if you want. And the whole idea here is that the, the quantumness of, uh, of an object, right? What makes it a quantum physical object uh, is the phase, right? So, hence quantum is where the phase is, and uh, note that the uh, the probability uh, in the quantum realm, right, of, of the photon going through one slit or the other can be larger than what you will see for classical objects, right, or it could be less, depending on the value of theta one minus theta two, right. Uh, there's this idea of decoherence that comes up naturally here then. Uh, in the sense that if the difference of the two angles, theta one and theta two, is a multiple of pi over two, odd multiple of pi over two, in fact, you see that the cosine goes to zero, sending this whole quantum feature to zero, and you reproduce for yourself the classical probability that you would expect to see for a classical object, right? Um, so, so this kind of gives, uh, this whole setup gives a nice transition from quantum to classical and back, right? Uh, the, the phase is what makes everything quantum. As soon as the phase goes away or becomes negligible, uh, you get yourself classical probability behavior uh, being exhibited. So it's a nice uh, mathematical transition and also a you know, nice way to capture mathematically the physical transi trans uh, transition from a quantum to classical object. So I'm going to try to uh, formalize this two-slit experiment a bit more mathematically. Uh, and so to that end, uh, let's go ahead and call uh, the two uh, slits that we had in the previous experiment, let's call them the elements of an orthogonal basis. So I'm introducing some linear algebra here, right? So my task is to try to get, capture uh, the physics of the two-slit experiment in a more mathematical fashion, more, more formal mathematical fashion. Uh, we'll apply some labeling on these two orthogonal basis elements. Uh, the top slit could be the element, you know, let's call it the element zero, and the bottom slit in the wall could be the element one. Uh, and we'll call these observable properties of a photon, right? So we can actually observe this, right? We, we would say, okay, let's do an experiment 
and try to de determine whether the photon went through the top slit or the bottom slit. So we'll call these things uh, observable properties because we can see them. Um, it turns out for various reasons, good reasons, uh, that the two slit experiment can in fact be copied onto this sphere that I've drawn here with the two slits sitting on opposite points of the sphere. I mean, it's a circle in this case, but we can think of it as a sphere. Um, and what happens then is that I can create what are known as quantum superpositions. These are, um, if you look at the expression here, this is a quantum superposition, A1 times zero plus A2 times one. This is really just a way of taking a fancy weighted average, right? So we do this all the time in you know classical physics and, and information theory. We take a weighted average. So something's happening with a certain probability and the complementary events happening with a different probability, right? And uh, now we're saying that we'll allow those weights to be not just real numbers, but complex numbers, A1 and A2. So that's what we call a quantum superposition. And I've drawn that here as a whole circle sitting uh, on the sphere, a certain distance from the observable states zero and one. So this little red star is um, representing one, as one, one representative it's actually, you can consider that to be one representative of a whole class of quantum superpositions, uh, a certain distant, distance away from one and zero. Uh, so here's the distance from one as an arc sitting on the sphere's um, boundary. And here's the distance from the state zero, also sitting on the boundary. Now, what we see is that we would like to imagine there's a right, you know, a right angle triangle here, right? Uh, but that's just our imagination because we're so used to classical physics. We, we live in the classical world, the Euclidean world, right? Where lines are all straight. And, and here would be another one. But really in the in the quantum realm, what's happening is that you have a curved geometry with respect to which everything is happening. So the distance is actually measured not along the straight line, which is just an imagination in my head, uh, but along this curved line here. And now what happens is when you make what's known as uh, a measurement, uh, an observation, right? You wanna know which state is this quantum superposition here in the red star form uh, going to appear when I look at it. Would it be zero or one? Well, it turns out that uh, the result's gonna produce the probabilities we saw previously, right? So we'll see a probability um, of, and let me just get the numbers here, here we go. So I'll see the red star, the quantum superposition as the state, observable state zero, with probability that is equal to the length of this projection of this arc on the, the axis here. And it's going to equal to the length of the weight on that uh, observable state, A1 amplitude squared. And I'll see it to be the other observable state with a probability A2 length squared. Uh, so clearly this length is bigger, so one would imagine that this is more likely to be the case, right? That you'll see this quantum superposition measuring as one uh, and so forth. So that's kind of a way to formalize this. Now, it's not just a nice mnemonic device. It's actually a good uh, mathematically sound procedure. We don't have to necessarily get into that right now, uh, but we might touch on this a little bit later. Uh, the point here that is to note is that when I make when I make this observation, this quantum measurement, which I'll talk about a little bit more in just a bit, um, I don't see what I was hoping to see before, right? The, the quantum is where the phase is. Situation was that the sum of the two complex numbers added up and length taken squared is what the probability was supposed to be with this quantum feature. That's not appearing here anywhere. All I'm seeing is A1 squared and A2 squared, which are just the P1 and P2 component of this formula. So it seems that when I try to observe the state of a quantum object, right, um, I lose all information about the phase. And that is indeed the case, right? So when you make a quantum measurement or observe the state of a quantum object, um, I've got some you know, vector algebra here. We don't have to really get into that necessarily. Uh, except for maybe just to show that the relative phase, which was not appearing in the previous slide, right, uh, can actually be manifested here with some basic uh, algebraic manipulation. So what ends up happening is that when you take a measurement, um, you end up taking the inner product of your quantum superposition with one or the other observable state, and that turns out to be this 
object right here, which has the phase information still in there. But as soon as I take its length and square it, I get R2, the real number squared, the length of that um, uh, vector squared, and I lose all information about the phase, right? And that is unfortunate because that's where the quantum is, right? All quantum properties, all quantum features of quantum computing, quantum information processing, QKD, all these te quantum technologies that are you know, under development, uh, it all lies in here and that's lost when we look at it, when we observe this thing. So punchline here is that phase, or which is also known as relative phase, decoheres under measurement and information is lost about the phase uh, in the process. So the question is, is there a mechanism to learn phase information, right? Um, so yes, there are phase estimation methods. Uh, these are statistical methods where you uh, make a certain choice, a, a clever choice of observables or orthogonal bases, as we said earlier, to estimate the phase uh, in the quantum state that you were working with. And uh, I think this, because this uh, talk is being recorded, I've provided these links here. Uh, this is a link to a very nice uh, video on YouTube which talks about exactly this idea, and I would uh, urge everybody to look at this when they get a chance. Uh, another more recent uh, development in this uh, topic uh, is something that I actually am pretty heavily involved with, uh, is the idea of using Nash embedding. Uh, this is a direct top-down method for embedding, which means that you make an identification of the quantum state space, right, which we just saw as a spherical object into the classical state space in such a way that the phase information is preserved and then the phase information is all about geometry. Um, so I gave a presentation on this uh, last year around the time September, I think, and uh, there's a YouTube video available for that uh, at this link and everybody's welcome to look at that. Uh, I don't want to get into that in too much detail because it's not directly related to the topic, of course, but you know, a uh, great topic to talk about in, uh, in general. So, so there are these mechanisms, you know, that people can employ to learn about the phase information. Uh, so the question is then fundamentally, what is the method that optimizes the phase information extraction, right? Um, is there one of the two methods that we just discussed on the previous slide, which one of them is the best one, right? Which one gives the best, most possible phase information extraction? Um, a better way to say this would be to say that you're trying to find phase information from a quantum state under the constraint of quantum measurement. So that makes this a game theory problem. And let's get into what game theory is then. So uh, very succinctly, I guess we could say uh, game theory is the uh, strategic interaction between players, and I put that in quotes, um, because you can call them agents, individuals, whatever, right? They don't have to be conscious players. They can be just physical objects, mechanisms uh, interacting with each other. Uh, so you're looking for strategic interaction between players over some common stakes or outcomes. Uh, and the assumption is that these players have non-identical or inconsistent preferences over these outcomes, right? Uh, so you imagine that if you are, you know, um, interacting over some common pot of, you know, money or food or whatever um, commodity, you, if you had the same preferences, there would be no conflict, right? People would figure out how to resolve their differences. There would be no need for strate strategic thinking. Uh, so the assumption is that that's not the case. So there's some inconsistency between what players prefer uh, with respect to what the outcomes are. Uh, the goal then in game theory is to find st strategies for each player, uh, these are actions, you know, or whatever uh, tactics you can call them, that maximize the payoff, and this could be a pneumatic evaluation of the preferences that we just talked about, under the constraint of inconsistent preferences over the outcomes. So I have some constraints, um, they're different between the players, and so what can each player do to maximize the payoff, the satisfaction he or she gets uh, from, you know, getting a certain, uh, element of the outcome set. So a good example of uh, games is Prisoner's Dilemma. So, so it's a very nice game, captures a lot of uh, you know, features of what strategic thinking is all about. Uh, in this uh, game, we have the outcomes labeled here as uh, two numbers, 33055011. And uh, we have two players. We'll call uh, the players Ahmed and Bilkis. Um, 
and we'll define players preferences here down here uh, as Ahmed preferring the outcome 5-0. This little symbol means prefers over uh, the outcome 3-3, preferred over the outcome 1-1, preferred over the outcome 0-5. And Bilkis has similar but inconsistent, right? Different uh, preferences. In particular, the outermost uh, outcomes are preferred differently between the players, right? So Ahmed prefers 5-0 the most, uh, Bilkis prefers that the least, right? So, so that's the idea of inconsistent preferences. Uh, the question now becomes, uh, how do I make, what, what actions can I give to Ahmed and Bilkis, or what can be available to them? Uh, we'll call those actions pure strategies, labeled CD, CD for whatever reason, right? They're just uh, labels for the actions they can take. Uh, what would these be so that they can actually um, invoke or, or manifest an outcome in the game that is consistent with the combined preferences of both players, right? So that's kind of the question in in-game theory, fundamentally speaking. Uh, so that's what it means to say solve the game. So when we're solving the game, uh, in an ideal scenario, each player will engage in a strategic play that produces an optimal outcome. An optimal outcome is the one that is closest to every player's most preferred outcome. Uh, on the other hand, that is not what we see in, in real life and in game theory in principle, uh, in the theory of uh, games. Typically, what you see is that players are engaging in a play that produces an outcome optimal in the sense of satisfying the constraints of their non-identical preferences over the outcomes. Uh, such an outcome has the property that in the corresponding strategy profile, right, whatever strategy each player chooses, one notes that the each player's strategy is the best reply to the other players, right? And if you had more than two players, you would say that each player has the best reply to all other players' strategy, strategic choices. So when that happens, you call that outcome a Nash equilibrium. Uh, you're, you're basically making a best reply to your opponent. Uh, unfortunately, Nash equilibrium is not always optimal, right? Uh, and we shall see how this plays out in Prison's Dilemma, which is uh, again presented here. Uh, if you look at the situation uh, carefully, you'll notice that the optimal outcome is 3-3 three, three for both players, right? Uh, remember, we defined optimal outcome as an outcome that is closest to each player's most preferred outcome. So Ahmed prefers 5-0 most, and Bilkis prefers 0-5 the most, and 3-3 three, three is an outcome that's closest to both players most desired outcome. So we would call that an optimal outcome. On the other hand, the outcome 1-1 one, one down here is what the Nash equilibrium is. So how does one compute the Nash equilibrium? Well, you could reason something like this. You could say, okay, let's imagine that uh, Ahmed employs the strategy C. So here's what's going to happen. So the numbers 3 and 3 have a meaning. When Ahmed plays C, uh, the reason he prefers 3-3 three, three over 1-1, one, one, as in the preference profile, is because he gets a payoff of 3 here. So the first entry in the uh, pair 3-3 three, three is the payoff to Ahmed, and the second number is a payoff to Bilkis. So, and similarly for all the other pairs. So when Ahmed chooses C, he gets a payoff of 3. And the question is, how should Bilkis respond to that choice uh, of strategy by Ahmed? Well, she should apply with a D because then she gets the payoff of five, which is bigger than three, right? So her best reply to C would be playing D. But then if she plays D, then the question is, is C a best reply by Ahmed to Bilkis's choice of D? And the answer is no, because in this case he gets zero. So he would prefer to actually switch to D as well because that's where he gets five or one, right? Which is better than zero. So reasoning this way gives you this idea that both players will settle down, equi equilibrate uh, at the outcome 1-1, one, one, which is uh, the, uh, sorry, I said HH here, you should say DD, my mistake, I apologize for that. Uh, the outcome DD is the Nash equilibrium in this game. Uh, now, oh, sorry, let me just go back really quickly and make the point that notice that 1-1 one, one is hardly optimal, right? It's a Nash equilibrium, but it's not the out optimal outcome. 
this is what everybody prefers, but this is where everybody ends, which is unfortunate. Now, things can actually get much worse. Uh, here's another game uh, which is called Matching Pennies, and if Ahmed and Bilkis uh, play this game, uh, they will uh, end up with the situation that there will be no Nash equilibrium whatsoever. Uh, and you can do a reasoning as before, where you say, okay, if Ahmed employs the strategy H, he gets the payoff of one. Should Bilkis reply with H? No, because she gets negative one. Uh, she can do better by switching to T, where she gets one. But Ahmed no longer has any incentive to stick with H because he's getting negative one here. So he switches to T as well. Right now, if she he switches to T, Bilkis gets a payoff of negative one, and there's no reason for her to stick with this choice of T, and she moves back to H. But then the same reasoning you know, starts again, and you end up going around in circles and getting no equilibrium as uh, in the case of, um, uh, sorry, the previous game, Prisoner's Dilemma. So, so you have these worst case scenarios where you engage in a game, some kind of economic activity or some kind of a transaction, where nobody's happy and no, everybody's stuck in this like, you know, volatile uh, conflict, if you will, right? Perpetual warfare. And that's unfortunate. So what, what's the way around it? Well, the way around this is to uh, employ mixed strategies. And mixed strategies are basically randomization over the outcomes, which are uh, produced by randomization by the players over their pure strategies. So it's the old idea, right? When you're not able to decide on something which is favorable, you toss a coin, right? Or some, some sort of randomizing object. So pretty straightforward idea. But of course, the, the uh, dramatic result in, in, in this uh, process is that uh, every player, every game in which you randomize, as long as the game is finite in the sense that number of players is finite and the strategic choices are finite, they, there's always an equilibrium guaranteed in terms of mixed strategies, randomization. Uh, this is the result that won John Nash his uh, Nobel Prize. And this is a guy about who uh, there was a movie made, I think about 18 years ago now. Um, uh, it's a good movie to watch and uh, um, I, I encourage everybody to watch it. Uh, now, what, what does this mean for us? Uh, here, what, what this means is that, you know, when you have no Nash equilibrium in a game, you can employ randomization and you're guaranteed to have an equilibrium, uh, a settling point, right? Some kind of an end to the game. Uh, but if you're lucky, sometimes you can also get a better paying Nash equilibrium than what was available in the original case, right? Uh, on the other hand, it is the case that sometimes this is not enough, right? So, in fact, for Prince's Dilemma, it can be shown that even if you employ randomization, uh, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium will be the same as the one before. So, so nothing changes. And that's just, you know, unfortunate, but, you know, people then look for the other ways to go around this situation. Uh, and to this end, we have something called mediated communication, where the idea is that, okay, if you, the players cannot come up with independent uh, randomization over their choice of strategies, Produce, to produce some randomization over the outcomes, maybe they can employ the, the uh, services of the village elder or a referee who creates randomization over the outcomes in a way that was not possible with mixed strategies, right? And this gives you another kind of randomization, a higher order of randomization over the strategies of the players. Uh, this is called, called mediated communication, and uh, the referee communicates. It's important to note that the referee communicates privately with each player uh, and, and recommends which strategy, strategy he or she should randomize over. So there's no uh, you know, communication between the players indirectly through the referee. It's just between the referee and the player. So, so what ends up happening, uh, I should uh, add here, is that in this case, uh, in some games, you actually get higher paying Nash equilibria than what was possible with mixed strategies or with pure strategies. And so it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little feature to have, which is not surprising because, you know, people have been doing it anyway for, for forever, right? Go talk to the referee. <laughs> now, um, Let's talk now. Let's switch to quantum game theory. So, just, so now we're going to talk about gaming the quantum. This is kind of the first step, or one of the one of the ways to look at how 
quantum mechanics, quantum information comes together with game theory. So remember, one of the questions we had was, uh, what is, in fact, the question we had was, what is the method that optimizes phase information extraction? Well, here, uh, what we do is we model the two-slit experiment as a two-player zero-sum game. Right? Zero-sum just means that uh, whatever is good for one player is bad for the other and vice versa. Now, in this case, we could say Ahmed is going to play the role of nature, right? And nature has this um, preference that uh, she wants the phase information in the quantum state of the photon from the two-slit experiment to be completely lost, right? So by that, I mean nature is doing measurement, right? Decoherence is what nature is creating, and uh, the phase information is being lost. And that is most preferred over the, the outcome where phase information is completely read, right, by somebody. Now that somebody would be Bilkis. You know, she would be the scientist in the lab who has the completely opposite preferences where she wants to read all the phase information in a photon state, uh, and she prefers that over definitely that over phase information being lost. And a relevant question in this case would be, what is the physical mechanism? And this would be the game that we're looking to construct. And uh, what are the strategies for each player, right? Nature versus scientists, so that some kind of an equilibrium could be reached, right? Uh, clearly, it's not, it's not going to be the case that the scientist, most likely not going to be the case, that the scientist will read all the phase information, right? And uh, hopefully nature won't have its way either. So you want some kind of a compromise in the middle, some kind of a constrained optimal solution that, that you're looking for. So in other words, is there, well, what I just said basically, right? Uh, and uh, th this is what uh, Simon Phoenix and myself, actually, we wrote a paper on this idea some years back. Uh, the paper is titled Gaming the Quantum. Uh, I have a link here. Uh, if people are interested, they could also search for it. Uh, it kind of lays out the the idea of how you apply uh, game theory to quantum me mechanical features, uh, quantum mechanical mecha quantum mechanical ideas, or quantum uh, informational mechanisms, uh, which is what we're trying to do here. Uh, there's another idea, related idea of uh, quantized games. So, for example, let's take a look at Prison's Dilemma again, and uh, you know, consider the scenario where Prison's Dilemma can be played. Uh, on some kind of a quantum technology uh, platform, like uh, you know, a quantum internet, which is connecting quantum computers together, uh, which we hope to see happening within the next 10 years. Uh, in this case, uh, we'll have quantum properties at our hand, uh, available to us, right, on hand. And the question is, can we do things that we couldn't do over the regular internet, connected to regular computers, right? And uh, one particular question more accurately would be what kind of mediation would be needed, right? This is kind of saying I, I'm sending information from my side to a quantum computer connected, uh, the quantum server connecting another player, another user, right? So the quantum computer uh, is acting in some sense as a referee, a quantum referee, right? Uh, facilitating uh, quantum mediated communication. Uh, here we see uh, this idea that perhaps quantum entanglement can be used to allow enhanced Nash equilibrium. Uh, for example, can players achieve the 3-3 three, three most optimal outcome in Prison's Dilemma? And the answer is yes, as we shall you know, soon see with reference to a paper. Uh, it's also possible that we can uh, have unhackable uh, features, right? unhackability features available to us where all our communications can never be hacked. So it turns out the, the comment here that I made that players can achieve the 3-3 three, three optimal uh, Nash equilibrium uh, in Prison's Dilemma uh, was shown to be the fact by Isert et al. in this paper here titled Quantum Games and Quantum Strategies. Uh, it was a paper, I think it was published in uh, 19, uh, 2000, the year 2000, so it's about 20, 21 years old. Uh, it's a solid result, uh, and I encourage everybody to read that. Uh, I also would like to recommend that people look at this uh, review article that uh, I wrote with some colleagues uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab and the Army Research Lab here in the US, um, which kind of you know gives a review of, of the whole topic of quantum game theory and different ways to look at it and apply it. So that might be uh, something that's useful. 
Now, uh, what does what is this? How, how do we bring quantized games and gaming the quantum together? Well, we bring them together in the form of quantum games, right? And, and we look at quantum games as quantum algorithms. So the question could be, uh, how do I think of uh, quantum algorithms that are better performing than classical algorithms, right? Um, as um, quantum games in the sense that they're optimizing some some feature, right? Under some constraints. So the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, best uh, quantum computation and input states preparation, right? To achieve desired outcomes upon measurements. So this is a paper I put together some years back. It's called Minimaximizing Two Qubit Quantum Computations. So the question that I addressed there was that uh, if I have certain constraints on what the outcomes should look like when I make a measurement of a quantum state, uh, right, two qubit quantum state, then what should be the game, right, the mechanism, the quantum computation constructed, and what should be the input state so I get the desired outcome? Um, so this was an example of applying uh, quantum game theory in the sense of quantum algorithms to study what quantum algorithms might behave like. And it is definitely the case that Grover's quantum search algorithm is actually a quantum game, um, which uh, is an optimal, uh, which is opt which gives an optimal outcome with 97.7% accuracy of finding the item that you're looking for in quadratic time. So if anybody is looking for a solid example of a quantum game in quantum computing and what is it good for, uh, I would say look at Grover's search algorithm. It's 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 how you you know it's the best example of how one can use quantum game theory to construct uh, quantum algorithms. Even though I, uh, Grover probably didn't think of it that way when he wrote that paper. <laughs> um, David Meyer, uh, who can definitely be called the father of quantum game theory, actually uh, studied the question of. Uh, how do you compare the performance of classical and quantum algorithms using game theory, right? So, so he has a paper called Quantum Strategies to which I've provided a link here, and you can just search for that. And it's a great paper uh, on the topic of, you know, constructing quantum algorithms that um, have the property that they outperform classical algorithms, even on a classical computer. So uh, definitely worth reading. Uh, and here's a nice little uh, example of uh, prisoner's dilemma, quantum prisoner's dilemma, uh, as a high frequency trading uh, application. So this is something that I'm working at right now uh, as as the chief science advisor of uh, Dark Star Quantum Lab, and a colleague who was uh, at Berkeley recently and has recently moved to uh, Montreal. Um, and the idea is that uh, there's a notion of uh, high speed, high turnover uh, rate financial trading using algorithms and you know computing technology. So this is called high frequency trading and the question is uh, can I model that as a game? Well yes I can model that as prisoner's dilemma and I could have Ahmed and Bilkis right uh, who would have the same uh, preferences over the same outcomes as before but I'll just relabel their strategies to sell and buy sell and buy instead of C and D. So this is what trading is all about, right? You either sell something or you buy something. And the question could be then, what is the optimal uh, strategy here, right? So should should uh, Ahmed and Milkis always buy? Both should always buy, both should always sell, or, or some combination, right, of these two? Well, if this is person's dilemma, then unfortunately they both end up in the Nash equilibrium being buy, buy, right? So nobody's selling, everybody's just buying. And uh, that's going to create demand, but presumably no supply, right? So that's going to have some impact on the economy of, of, of the market. Uh, the question is, uh, of course, that if I think of this as a quantum prisoner's dilemma, then can I realize the outcome 3 3, the optimal outcome as a Nash equilibrium? And as I said before, yes, uh, Isert and his colleagues showed that this is definitely possible if you use. Uh, quantum game theory. Now, uh, a relevant question comes up uh, that do does a game always have a Nash equilibrium, right? Uh, is it guaranteed? Well, as as we saw in the previous slide, uh, not always, right? In the game of matching pennies, you don't have a Nash equilibrium. 
On the other hand, if you introduce randomization, then you will always have a Nash equilibrium guaranteed. It may not be as you know better than before, but nonetheless, you're guaranteed to have one. So a similar question comes up in the sense that if you are playing quantum games, and I haven't told you how, well, how the details work, but but uh, I can just say this much. Uh, the pure quantum states of, an, of a quantum object are taken to be quantum strategies, right? Strategies in a quantum game. Uh, can there be a guarantee of Nash equilibrium in, in such a game? Well, that's an open question, right? It's, it's uh, just not answered yet. Uh, and the reason is that Nash, the theorem of Nash, right, that guarantees mixed strategy Nash equilibrium uses a Kakutani fixed point theorem, the Kakutani fixed point theorem, uh, to prove the existence of equilibrium in mixed strategies. As long as these games are played in the Euclidean space, which is the space of classical physics. So when you talk about quantum games, that's just not the right domain. Quantum games take place in a complex projective space. We saw an example of that in the one of the earlier slides in the form of a sphere, right? That was a uh, space of one qubit. Uh, for larger number of qubits, uh, the, the space becomes more convoluted but it remains a Riemannian manifold. And this is not a classical uh, physical space. So are there any Kakutani type fixed point theorems in the quantum space? Um, well, one way to address that is to say, let's use Nash's, the same Nash, but his other theorem, which is the embedding theorem, uh, to first meaningfully identify the quantum state space with the classical physical space, right? The Euclidean space then follow this identification to map the quantum game into the Euclidean space as a mixed game. And then from there, identify Nash equilibrium in the mixed game, which is always guaranteed, right? You always have one. So it's an indirect approach, but it's an elegant approach, and it uses two famous theorems by the same guy, right? So I really like this idea. Uh, once you have the Nash equilibrium in the mixed game in the classical world, you trace back the Nash equilibrium to the quantum space using the one-to-one uh, -one property of Nash embedding. Um, so it turns out I have a paper on that with uh, Travis Humble at Oak Ridge National Lab, and uh, that's the title. Uh, if people are interested, you can uh, certainly uh, look into that. So what are the applications then of quantum game theory to, to uh, quantum technologies? How do we optimize quantum technology using quantum games? So um, let's look at, look at the case of qubit design, right? Uh, how do I design a qubit as a quantum game? Where designer's goal is to preserve quantum phase. So this is the idea of a fault tolerant qubit. The qubits we have today are extremely faulty, right? They're noisy. Uh, they decohere uh, and lose phase information extremely quickly. Uh, but and, and the designer's goal is to preserve that, you know, make, make sure that doesn't happen or happens, you know, less frequently and with less um, frequency. Uh, on the other hand, nature wants to destroy this uh, phase, you know, make, via measurement or decoherence. So, how do we how do we uh, address this? Well, we look we we address this by looking for Nash equilibrium, optimal design of the qubit under the constraint of decoherence and measurement, and we do this using Nash embedding, which was the idea we just talked about, to map the quantum game here into the classical realm find the mixed strategy equilibrium, and then um, not only do we have a mixed strategy equilibrium that we can map back to the quantum world, right, and see what the optimal design of this fault tolerant qubit should look like, we also have this added nice feature that this always has, this also gives us a way to realize the qubits in the classical world, right, which is the challenge, right? If, if uh, the classical world was easily transitionable to the quantum world and vice versa, we would have no issue, right? But that is obviously the fundamental problem of uh, quantum physics. When you go from quantum uh, to the classical world and vice versa, uh, there's a lot of noise in the process and you lose quantum information. So these features uh, can help with that. And I think this, uh, I know I know definitely this brings the uh, presentation to the conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion is that, you know, game theory is the language of constraint optimization. There is no other way to study constraint optimization, uh, which we need to study, you know, carefully for uh, developing more optimal, high, high performance, you know, uh, quantum technologies, the next generation of quantum technologies. Uh, Nash equilibrium is the appropriate solution here. 
And uh, to make quantum technology practical, it requires constrained optimization. And uh, let me end with General Sen Su's uh, famous words. He was a uh, ancient Chinese general uh, who's known also who's known as the uh, I guess we could say the father of game theory, going back more than two thousand years ago. Uh, his statement is: Know yourself, know your enemy, and you will never lose a battle. Uh, so my recommendation, uh, these words of wisdom to to all quantum scientists, uh, you know, emerging quantum scientists, developing quantum scientists is to just uh, know, you know, what you're dealing with, know the constraints and uh, you'll have good results. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. You are most welcome. welcome. Thank you so much for this. Actually, we have a small question uh, in the chat here. The question is, um, how many outcomes should we consider in reaching a uh, Nash equilibrium? Uh, how many outcomes in general? Um, you yeah. can have is it, is it minimum or maximum? Uh, you can have many outcomes. You don't have to have four outcomes. You could have, uh, you know, as many as you uh, want, as long as they're finitely many. So you can have a guarantee of Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what about the, the Nash embedding? Uh, is it, can we use it in quantum machine learning as, as a kernel? Yes, uh, absolutely. Now, I'm not familiar with uh, the term, the notion of kernel in, in the machine learning. Uh, mm -hmm. but what is it? If you could perhaps maybe tell me and I can... Well, uh, simply enough, you can map uh, some features uh, in a small space to a higher dimensional space so that you can find like a separable uh, uh, hyperplane to separate like different points of, of your data set. Okay, absolutely. Uh, so, so the separating hyperplane theorem is actually how I think uh, uh, people came up with the notion of uh, the simplified notion of Nash equilibrium called uh, the minimax theorem. Uh, mm -hmm. This was you know, von Neumann and uh, Morgenstern. So clearly there's a connection here, right? Now, um, what, what seems to me to be the situation is that, so so people study, when, when you are when you look at statistical methods, right, to try to extract information, quantum information like phase, right? Uh, you try to do that by uh, looking at statistical manifolds, right? And these manifolds mm -hmm. have certain geometries and so forth. And you are basically trying to say uh, how am I, how well is the geometry of the Riemannian manifold of quantum state being preserved in the statistical manifold? Mm -hmm. So, so, so the idea being that it's the it's the metric or distances, right, that kind of um, decohere when you go from quantum to classical. Um, and uh, so, so that's what they're trying to do. But what Nash embedding does is it actually gives you a uh, mathematical way, uh, uh, which means that it gives you a way to go from the quantum uh, Riemannian manifold to the classical manifold isometrically, meaning that your uh, geometry is preserved. It's guaranteed to be preserved. So, so there's I think where the connection is that you know when you're studying things like you know these um, algorithms, uh, the uh, the variational algorithms for quantum quantum computers and trying to extract information, right? Uh, Nash embedding is probably the uh, most robust way to do it. Okay. But difficulty, of course, lies in the fact that when you study it, it's very hard to make an algorithm out of it. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, I think uh, Professor Ahmed Yunus uh, would like to say something. So. Uh, actually, uh, I, I think this will be the last question because we have to switch to the next uh, session. So this will be a quick question. Uh, you mentioned when you mentioned the quantum internet that uh, the Nash equilib equilibrium uh, is unhackable. The, th the three three choice is unhackable in terms of the security. Uh, is the optimal uh, choice is unhackable as well, or it is only Nash equilibrium? The uh, one one choice. Right. So so I think I, I wasn't very uh, careful with my words. Uh, I was trying to say what I was trying to say was that uh, the whole notion of a quantum internet uh, is in principle unhackable. So oh, okay. if the yeah. whole, whole quantum internet is unhackable, then any communication, uh, in particular, as you said, Nash equilibrium, right, the optimal choice, uh, nobody would be able to figure out what that is, you know, between the two players. Uh, and so you'll have these added security features, uh, which will make the market more stable, right? <laughs> For example, my, my last question before we go to the next decision: What happens to Alice and Bob? 
is they replaced with Ahmed and Tafis. Alex yeah. and Bob uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> got Alice COVID-19 and or something. <laughs> they, they've got a new job now. Yeah, okay. Good <laughs> luck to them. Thank you very much for being with us today, uh, Professor uh, uh, Faisal. Uh, we are looking forward for more meetings and more cooperation in the future. Inshallah, I look forward to that too. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor you. Yunus. It's a pleasure. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, so, Karim, please uh, can we uh, close this session?